Hello, everyone, and welcome to Victoria and Congress 2016. My name is Lynn Geddes, and I am chair of the Congress Education Committee. <laughs> we are so pleased, so very pleased, to have you here today to join us in this, our second year of a symposium-style session. And this year, it is focusing on the theme of promoting healthy aging. Today's speaker is a professor and head of the research unit for musculoskeletal function and physiotherapy at the University of Southern Denmark, an honorary professorial fellow at the University of Melbourne, and an adjunct professor at La Trobe University in Melbourne, Australia as well. Dr. Roos has actually asked me to edit very heavily what I had written down here so that she would have the majority of time. So in faithfulness to that, I am actually going to cut out the next paragraph because I believe her presentation will actually highlight much of her research activity. She will be uh, opening our symposium by discussing why improving physical activity is an essential component of promoting healthy aging. Exercise is a lifestyle intervention beneficial for many chronic conditions. However, pain is the most common barrier in the elderly for increasing physical activity, with knee pain being the most common type of musculoskeletal pain. Paradoxically, we all know that exercise can in fact relieve that pain. And so through her presentation, Dr. Roos is going to show how exercise fits into our treatment toolbox, how it compares to surgical options, the long-term effects that it affords, and why and when prescribed for knee and hip pain actually helps to not only relieve that pain, but also positively affect risk factors for cardiovascular disease and diabetes. And so I'm going to turn the podium over to whom you're really here to listen to, to Dr. Roos, and um, have her come forward and present her results of her research and speak to us. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me. And, and this is a little greeting from my research unit back home to all of you. <coughs> there are some dramatic changes ahead. And there are some grand challenges to our societies. Because the population is aging, getting heavier, more inactive, and chronic diseases are becoming more common. But as physiotherapists, you can choose to think about this as a great opportunity. Because what is it that physios really are good at? If I think about physios across different specialties, I think we're good at improving function. And many of you are also very good at managing pain because that is something that you do in your daily praxis. And taken together, these two skills fit very well into the toolbox that we need to facilitate healthy aging. So I think that physiotherapists are imperative in this to help uh, this agenda. So what is the first thing that you would think about if this guy came walking into your clinic, besides the fact that you may think it's a bit rude that he's shirtless, I think. I would think that he would need to lose weight. And I'm pretty sure that most of you would think that as well. And I'm pretty sure that that is what he's thinking about as well. But it doesn't help, because losing weight is very, very difficult. And those of you who have tried, and after a vacation, we all know what it feels like, you know, and it's like it takes up a lot of brain space and your whole body system goes into alert and all the alarm bells start ringing because your body don't want to lose weight because back in at the Stone Age, you know, that was not a good thing for you. So it's really difficult to lose weight. And on a population level, we have not been very successful with this agenda. So I think it's time that we start asking ourselves, is really weight loss the first thing that we should talk to this person about? 
or is there something else that we could do to help improve a healthy life and healthy aging? And there is a good rationale for the media messages that are out there when it comes to exercise as an alternative to improve a healthy life and healthy aging. And increasingly, there is also substantial evidence that being physically active, even if you're overweight or obese, is a good thing because it seems like physical activity can moderate or mediate the risk factors that the obesity creates. So maybe it's true what it says down here. If you stay physically active, your weight doesn't matter. I will not go through this body of evidence. I'm sure others will talk about that in other sessions, but the research nerd in me really wanted to show you some breaking news. So I decided to, to talk a little bit about what is the optimal BMI and what has happened over time. So on this graph, you have BMI on the x-axis and you have the risk uh, for all-cause mortality on the y-axis. And this is a U or a J-shaped curve. So if you have a high BMI, you have a high risk of premature death. And it's the same thing if you have a very low BMI. But at some point, you know, you have the lowest risk. So back in the 70s, the BMI for the lowest risk was 23.7. And some 15 years later, it had increased to 24.6. And 30 years later, it was 27. And that is not even normal weight. That is overweight. So what we see is that with time, the optimal weight, or optimal BMI for a long life has increased. And now actually being overweight is associated with the least risk. Isn't that strange? I don't know why, because these are epidemiological studies, and they can just, <coughs> um, they can just uh, give thought for hypotheses, and they don't give the answers. Uh, but there are a few, few thought, things that have been put forward. And one is that, with time, we have become increasingly better at managing chronic diseases. So today, we're much better at monitoring high blood pressure, diabetes, and high cholesterol. And that is surely true. So that that may work as a mediator, uh, even if you're overweight. And having a little extra fat on your body may help you through these um, um, illnesses or crisis periods in your life. That's, that's the philosophy behind. But I, I would like to emphasize that this is pure speculation. Another thing that was uh, noted in this very large cohort that was studied, that was that that population was much more physically active in 2013 than back in the 70s. So that's also uh, a plausible reason for, for um, th these findings. So in this way, it would be the physical activity that mediates uh, the risk of, of um, overweight and obesity. And the way this works is that having a higher muscle mass is actually associated with a lower all-cause mortality. And the muscles, they are a hormonal or organ that communicates with other organs in the body. So they communicate with the adipose tissue, with liver, pancreas, bone, and brain. And they also um, have hormones and, and myokines that actually helps to decrease inflammation. And if you're interested in this area, this, this is a good review where you can start. So there are mechanisms showing why it may be that exercise and physical activity can help mediate the risk factors from obesity. So altogether, there is a lot of evidence that getting moving toward better health is a good approach. And it may be a more feasible approach than asking people to lose weight. So I will now move on into my area, which is musculoskeletal diseases, uh, with a focus on osteoarthritis. 
So osteoarthritis during the last 20 years has taken a giant, giant leap. But the evidence that we know and that we have has not really been translated into clinical practice. So this, I think, is a typical consultation with a, with a general practitioner, at least in my country. So we have a patient to come to see their doctor who would ask, how are you? Does your knee hurt? And the patient would say, I want to know what is wrong. I want to have it fixed. And both, both those two things are very legitimate questions and, and wishes. But the patients all also usually know what they want. They want an MRI and they want surgery. So the general practitioner is sitting there and wondering, what are my options? How can I treat this person? Paracetamol is usually the first thing that comes up, NSAIDs. But it could also be a referral to imaging or a referral to an orthopedic surgeon. This does not align with the clinical guidelines for osteoarthritis. And the evidence is so strong that the clinical guidelines actually are the same all around the world. So it's to start with education, exercise, and weight control for everyone who seeks medical care because of pain in the knee or hip. That's the first line treatment. But what happens in reality is that a lot of people actually start on this level when they see the GP, and then they maybe get referred to surgery, and then they circulate in this top of the pyramid, and they never really get access to the first-line treatment. This is a figure of those about 50 randomized control trials that have been performed to study the role of exercise in knee osteoarthritis. So they're all randomized studies, and they are listed in, uh, under year of publication. So this is 1992 to 2012. So what you can see here is that if this little estimate here is on the right of this line, that means that there was a better effect in the exercise group compared to the control group. So in the first study in 1992, there was an effect in favor of the exercise group. And here you have the cumulative estimate. So here, the, these two studies have been, have been added into one, and here all the three first, the four first, etc. So when you do it this way, you can see that already here around in 2004, we had compelling evidence that exercise is, knee, is uh, pain relief for knee osteoarthritis. And the size of the effect is so strong, and the evidence is so strong, that performing yet another study will not change the results. But although we have done all these studies, and I'm sure there will be more to come, we can call that research waste, because they are not needed. So it's a waste of money, waste of patients' time. And why do we do them? Maybe because it's a paradox, because how can exercise relieve pain. It's not a good story. It doesn't really appeal to us. Maybe that's why. I don't know. So all this bulk of evidence has helped us change the paradigm from thinking that rest is good to that exercise therapy is really good if you have pain. But the question is, how good is it? And is it good enough to make a difference? Because what does this mean? That doesn't really tell us much, does it? I'll try to answer those questions. But then we have to, to decide upon what is good and what is making a difference. So this is actually data from uh, a report from Canada where they showed that if there was a, a pain management intervention that would decrease pain with 33%, you would save lots and lots of billions in the Canadian health economy. So what are the options? What are the possibilities? So in this graph, you can see 
education, weight loss, exercise therapy, paracetamol, and NSAIDs. And on the y-axis you can see the effect size. The higher, the better. Usually we would say that 0.2 is a small, 0.5 is a moderate, and 0.8 is a large effect size. And 0.5 is definitely clinical, clinically relevant. So if we have a look at these options that are the non-surgical options for uh, knee osteoarthritis, you can see that exercise is by far the most effective treatment. It's actually three times better than paracetamol that we call painkillers. Interesting branding, isn't it? Call something painkillers that actually doesn't relieve the pain at all. Maybe we should call it painkilling exercise. <laughs> Do you think that would help? It is a lot about branding and physiotherapy needs to learn a lot about branding. But when we look at this graph here, this is from the meta-analysis that I showed you before. And in this bar, we have all the different studies that have been performed. And they have looked at different types of exercise, and it's been varying doses. So what we try to tease this apart, and we used meta-regression analysis to look at these different features of the studies. And to give you one simple message, it is that exercise is like any other drug, it is dose responsive. You need to do enough to get the effect. So it would be like, like thinking about an antibiotic and you would say that, well, if the healthcare system doesn't have the money to give me the full, do full uh, dose of antibiotics that I need, maybe I'll only take half. That wouldn't happen. But that is what happens in many countries today when it comes uh, to these diseases because we know that you need 12 sessions. Is 12 sessions reimbursed in Canada? Then you should make sure it become because else it's meaningless and using a drug like exercise and if you prescribe it with a too low dose then you will get bad reputation. People don't trust the drug anymore. That is what will happen and you need to work with that. So let's say now that our general practitioner here, she's in the audience. She has listened to me. She knows my message. She knows what I would like to say. So here she is. Now she knows about the guidelines. But that raises a million questions in her head. The first maybe is, do I believe in this? And can I persuade the patient? Because he has totally different expectations. And can I prescribe it? How do I as, I, as a GP, prescribe this drug? And what is exercise, really? And I think that is a very good question where I would like to start. Because we, have, we think about exercise as very different things. A lot of patients would think about exercise therapy as t going for a walk. That is not exercise therapy, in my mind, or the way it's defined. This is physical activity. That is any kind of, of exercise that will um, burn calories. So this is physical activity, very, very unspecific. Some patients think that I want them to run a half a marathon. Well, that is what we call exercise. That's not what I want, but that is what we call exercise, and that is defined as what we do to enhance our performance. So what I am talking about really is exercise therapy, which is a planned regimen that is progressed of sufficient dose and has the goal to reduce pain and improve function. These things are very different and differ in specificity. But let, let's just uh, skip to something else. And I would like to talk a little bit about surgery, because surgery is something that we have an understanding about how good it is. And that is something that is commonly used in musculoskeletal uh, diseases. So if you've come from a country close to here, a little bit south, you may see this advertisement in the newspaper. 
And here is this young woman. She's probably in the Caribbean somewhere, and she's got a little Band-Aid here. <laughs> and she had back surgery two weeks ago. And we don't see her face, but I think she looks happy. So the question is, how good is surgery, really? So I have been fortunate enough to have a very good collaboration with orthopedic surgeons for many, many years. And we have done some quite um, interesting studies. So this was the first study that we did that got published in New England Journal of Medicine in 2010. And this study was the first and still is the only of its kind. So we studied young adults who had an anterior cruciate ligament injury. And we gave them, we randomized them to one of two treatments. They both got rehabilitation with the neuromuscular exercise, and then we randomized them to have their knee surgically reconstructed or not. So one group had physio only, and one group had surgery and physio. So what happened was that in the second group, who started with physio only, 50% later on during the first five years had their knee reconstructed, and 50% had not. But what were the results? So at two and five years, there was no difference between the groups in anything. There was no difference in function, no difference in pain, no difference in quality of life. There was no difference in their ability to return to sport. That is the major reason to have surgery. There was no difference in meniscal surgery. That's the other major reason to do surgery, to prevent the meniscus, to prevent osteoarthritis. And there was no difference in osteoarthritis. And we could save every other uh, orthopedic procedure. So maybe that was the first time when they said on CNN that seeing a physio is not a bad thing if you have an ACL injury. So let's move on to a middle-aged group. Middle-aged groups uh, usually would have knee arthroscopy where they would have something done to their meniscus. Having a degenerative meniscal tear is very, very common during middle age. And this is the most common orthopedic procedure. There has been nine randomized controlled trials on uh, the effect of surgery. There has been no, still no good trial comparing orthopedic surgery to exercise only. It has been accepted, but I can't tell you about it yet. But from these other nine studies that have already been performed, we have summarized the results. And that was surgery compared to sham surgery, like theater, or uh, other kinds of uh, combina combined treatments. So to keep it short, so we found that there is a small and inconsequential effect seen from the interventions that include arthroscopy for this middle-aged degenerative knee. But it's limited in time. We could see the effect at three and six months, but it's absent at one to two years after surgery. And we also found that knee arthroscopy is associated with harms, with DBTs, with other things, actually also with death. It's not common, but it happens. So taken together, these findings don't support current practice of doing this procedure in middle-aged people. And this small and inconsequential benefit, it was 2.4 millimeters on a 0 to 100 scale. So what about joint replacement then. How good is that? So hip replacement started back in the 50s, and it's a very, very successful procedure, and it has changed the lives of millions of people. It has really, really changed, uh, been, a, been a game changer. And knee uh, replacement was developed with time and came a few decades later. And the numbers are increasing. They are maybe tripling during 10 years from uh, 1997 to 2007. And it's the same all over the world. And it's the same for knee and hip replacement. And, and this is the a projection for the need for total knee replacements in the US. So the need 
by 2030 is 3.48 million procedures. That's a lot. So if this is the number of procedures that is needed, this is the number of surgeons available in the States. So it won't, it's not even possible that uh, they could even um, cover this demand. And also the orthopedic surgeons have started to question if everyone needs surgery. <laughs> And one should ask oneself, is there really a need for more <coughs> surgery? And what is the outcome from total joint replacement? Really? So if we summarize the result, we can see that eight out of 10 patients who have their knee replaced and nine out of 10 patients who have their hip replaced, they experience pain relief. That is very, very good. But it also means that two out of 10 who have their knee replaced does not experience pain relief. So they either have the same status after surgery or they're worse. And one out of 10 for the hips. So hip surgery is a better procedure than knee surgery and that has been shown repeatedly. And there is actually a lack of evidence for total knee replacements. But do we need it? Do we need to do randomized control trials of a procedure that is this successful? Well, let's say that we wanted to do this completely unneeded and hypothetical trial. And we took patients who had moderate to severe osteoarthritis and they had all seen an orthopedic surgeon who said, yes, you're el eligible for the procedure. And then we randomized them both groups, just as in the ACL studies, would get, would get perfect non-surgical treatment, and then we randomize them to surgery or not. And we would follow them for 12 months, and we would look at pain, function, crossover rate to surgery, and adverse events. So I hope you're all awake now, because now I'm gonna ask you some questions. So how many of you think that those who have their joint replaced in addition will have more pain relief. Hands up. Oh, come on. This is the best surgical procedure. Those opposed? Oh dear. You are physios. <laughs> so the second question would be, do you think that those who would have their joint replaced would have more adverse events? Hands up if you think so. And those opposed? And now the trickiest question. How many do you think would cross over and have their joint replaced during the first year of follow-up? 75%, three out of four. <coughs> Hands up. 50%. Twenty-five percent. I can tell you that this is not the response that I do when I do this for orthopedic surgeons. <laughs> <laughs> so we did this trial. So I'll give you the answer very shortly. And the way that you can think about this trial is also about what about the role of exercise in patients with severe osteoarthritis? That's another way of thinking about this trial. So what we did was that we educated all the patients about their disease. And they got the type of education that we include in something called a GLAD, and I'll soon talk more about that, where the aim is to increase the knowledge of osteoarthritis and the treatment options that are available. We also gave them 12 sessions of neuromuscular exercise. And if they were overweight, they got to see a dietitian. And if they had something that biomechanically needed to be corrected with insoles, they got insoles. And if the orthopedic surgeon thought that they would need analgesics to start exercising, they got analgesics. So we had 100 patients who had uh, agreed to participate in this study 
without knowing if they would have their knee replaced or not. So we randomized them either to the non-surgical treatment only or the non-surgical treatment with the surgery in addition. It was 100 patients. Their mean age was 66 years. They were obese. And most of them had severe osteoarthritis on radiographs. Two out of three used pain medications during the last week. And on a scale from zero to 100, when it comes to pain and function, they were, as a group, in the middle. So what were the results? So from the non-surgical treatment only, we got a, at one year, this is not directly after treatment, this is at one year, a 30% pain relief. And do you remember the number, the figure from the Canadian report? How many billions of dollars you can save if you have something that can reduce pain with 30%? And we also found that how much is 30%? What does that mean for patients? Well, in this case, it meant that three out of four had not had their joint replaced. And there were no serious adverse events. In the group who had surgery in addition, we found a much greater pain relief. They had a 60% pain relief. But it came at a price because 11% had a serious adverse event. So there were DVTs, there was stiffness leading to mobilization under anesthesia, there was a fracture, there was a deep infection. So altogether it resulted in eight other surgeries, inclusive one removal of a prosthesis, knee fusion, skin transplant, and scar tissue removal. And I would like to remind you that the, this trial does not tell anything about the effect from surgery only, because we haven't studied that. You have to remember that. I cannot tell you anything about the outcome from surgery alone. But you can use these data to guide your patients who are considering how, what treatment is the best for them. Because there is not one treatment that is the best for everyone. So if you are considering the surgical and the non-surgical route, you should know that you can expect a greater pain relief. Actually, 85% reported clinically relevant improvement, but it comes at a price. There is a risk with it that you need to be aware of. If you're considering the non-surgical route only, you can expect, on a group level, lesser pain relief, but actually 68% reported a clinically relevant improvement. And that was enough for three out of four to postpone their surgery for at least one year, and there were no serious adverse events. So now I would like to shift the topic and talk about how effective, effective is education and exercise in real life. But before I do that, I think you need a little break because this is a really long talk. So I would like you to do some chair stamps. <laughs> so now you have to check your <coughs> chairs so that they are safe. Maybe you would have to do it two and two so we don't have anyone sitting on the floor. And I think you all know this test. So on my count, start counting. Just wait. OK, are you ready? Go. did you do? <laughs> I can hear a lot of laughter in here. Isn't that interesting? After only 30 seconds of exercise. Hmm. Well, so how did you do? How many had more than 17 
So if you had more than 17, and I know about the problem with the chairs, <laughs> you were among the 10% best of the patients with osteoarthritis that we have treated in the program we call GLAD. How many had more than 12? So then you're among the 50% best at baseline of the patients that we have treated in Denmark. So let's get back to the topic. How effective is education and exercise in real life? Because now we're going to leave the research uh, lab and go out into real life. And I would like to talk about Good Life with Osteoarthritis in Denmark, GLAD, which is an implementation of evidence-based care for knee and hip osteoarthritis into clinical practice. And I would like to acknowledge my partner in crime, Soren Sko, who is a very brilliant and uh, hardworking young man, and without him this would never have been possible. And the reason why two researchers decided that we are the ones who need to transform healthcare in our country was that we had approached uh, the healthcare authorities for years and years and years about the evidence that we knew about and the clinical guidelines, but we found that the politics, organization, financing, reimbursement, patient beliefs, there are so many barriers to change in healthcare. And it was a barrier that the program was delivered by physiotherapists and not by doctors. Reimbursements, the organization, communities, healthcare in hospitals, and patients' beliefs. And they get a lot of their beliefs from the newspapers, not necessarily evidence-based. So what is GLAD? Well, GLAD is three things. One is a two-day course for physiotherapists and we held the first course back in 2013. They come to our university. We teach them everything we know. <laughs> they then go back into their clinical practice and they deliver a standardized but individualized treatment. And that is also important. So they give three sessions of patient education. Two of them are held by a physiotherapist and the third, which is optional, is held by an expert patient. And that's very well received by the patients, but it's not always that we have access to expert patients. They also deliver 12 sessions of individualized physiotherapy supervised exercise for patients in group. In groups. That is also important because patients like groups. They like to talk to each other. And it takes some pressure off your shoulders. And in addition to this, uh, the physios, they could deliver whatever treatment they wanted, but they needed to do the education and the exercise. So that means that if you think you need to do some manual therapy to improve the range of motion, you can absolutely do that. So I would like to say a few words about neuromuscular exercise. And what is uh, particular with neuromuscular exercise is that it aims it targets the osteoarthritis joint, and the aim is really to improve dynamic joint function and trust in your knee. And the whole idea why that is important is because a lot of these people, they don't trust their joints. And that's a barrier for them to participate in other types of physical activity in the community. So we give them a start um, with exercise that is focused on the joint. They do some aerobic exercise to warm up on a bike, and they do some strength training, but it's very poorly done, I would say. If improving strength was the purpose, we could do it much better with machines, but that is not our purpose. So alignment is alpha and omega in neuromuscular training, and those of you who have worked with uh, knee injury prevention, for example, you will recognize the principles because it's exactly the same principles. We have just adapted it for an older age group. So these are some little videos just to show you what it's all about. And I asked not to get this sound, but now we can listen to some Swedish music because we also <laughs> think that music is important for these patients. And we have learned that the music should be from the time when they were young. So as you can see, 
there are different levels. These are level three, so they are difficult ones, and that can be changed. So that is how you can individualize it. We give three different levels. You can come up, if you are creative, with lots of more levels. These are just examples. And it would also be, this is what I would call, that what we call muscle strength. But really, this is a lot about um, keeping alignment as well. And in this exercise, it's really the hip that you're standing on that is um, exercised the most. These were just some examples. There are four different circles with different focus. And there is also some gait retraining at the end where they walk backwards and forward. And backward walking is very good because that is not an automated behavior. So then you can change if you have a poor walking pattern. We also do pain monitoring. This is important because patients are in pain and they are worried and they are anxious. So we teach them how to deal with and manage their pain. And we have two simple rules. At most acceptable pain directly following exercise and the pain should not improve from day to day. And we have seen that it is possible to exercise and, and sticking to these two rules for patients across all levels of osteoarthritis. And we have shown that in many studies now. And the third part of GLAD is evaluation. So we have an electronic register where we register the data from these patients. It's patient descriptives, self-reported outcomes, and it's also objective tests like the share stand that you just did. That's why I know how good you were compared to osteoarthritis patients in Denmark. So in December 2015, we had trained more than 500 physical therapists around Denmark. And the GLAD was offered at more than 200 clinics across the whole country. Denmark is a small country with 5.5 million people, but as you can see, there are clinics also in the small islands. And it is a huge success. So as of today, we have data for more than 13,500 patients in our registry. And we have actually never advertised the course. So I would like to share some data with you. And this will be from the close to 10,000 patients that have started the program up until last year. And you can see the close to 6,000 and a little bit more than 2,000 that had um, passed the three months and 12 months follow-up time points. And if you're more interested, you can find the annual report in English on this website. So, the average GLAD person is an overweight 64-year-old married woman with knee pain. 25% have hip pain and 75% have knee pain. And most patients have problems for more than one joint and medical comorbidities are common. And what are the main results? Well, now you have to remember that this is a registry this is not a very controlled research project. This is real life. But what we, the answers that we get when we ask patients is that 30% of those who were on the labor market, they were, uh, had, had been on sick leave during the year prior to taking the program. But when we ask them at one year following the program, only 20% had been on sick leave during the follow-up year. That looks like there is a decrease. It may be due to other reasons, I cannot tell, but it seems likely that maybe GLAD has something to do with it. We could also see that there is a decrease in the use of pharmacological pain relief. And actually one out of three completely stopped to take painkillers. And the numbers were the same for paracetamol, NSAIDs and opioids. And this is very important because if we can stop people from taking these drugs, that will really uh, change the risk factors for cardiovascular disease. And we can see that physical activity level went up. And what is important here is that it was not only directly after the program at three months, 
but it was maintained at one year. This is very, very important. And my belief, because I don't know, but my belief is that it is the combination of education and exercise that is doing the trick. Because we need to understand why it's important to change the way we live and how we're physically active. This is also extremely important because this will also affect the risk factors for cardiovascular disease and diabetes and other chronic diseases. And we could see that in real life, we can actually translate the findings from the research uh, lab out into real life and we can see that we have uh, reductions in pain intensity around 25% in patients who have knee and hip pain at three and maintained at 12 months. So you remember the 30% from the Canadian report? And 94% of patients, they like lead much or very much, and they tell us that they use what they have learned at least weekly. So there is a pain management intervention that decreases pain with 25% in thousands of patients in clinical practice in Denmark. And as I said, you can read more about it in the annual report if you're interested. So in summary, some 20 years ago, when a person had a heart attack or had a heart problem, it was very frequent that the first encounter this person had with the healthcare system was when he had a heart attack and fell over in the street and got rushed into the hospital. Those were the days. Today we are very, very good at screening for risk factors, monitoring them, and treating early. But when it comes to knee pain, we're still there that we wait and wait and wait and wait until the joint dies, so we can replace it. I think we need to change that, because there are non-surgical treatment options that can be used much, much earlier, maybe 5, 10, 15 years earlier, and that are effective, and that relieves pain with 25 to 30 percent. We just don't use them. So what can we do to make sure that they get used? We can educate patients and clinicians about non-surgical treatment. We can improve the tool kit. And there is a missing piece here. And for that reason, we have collaborated with researchers here in Canada, and they have now created GLAD Canada. And we don't have any data from Canada yet, but uh, there is a pilot study going on at the Holland Orthopedic and Orthopedic Center in in Toronto, and from what the patient says, they don't seem that very different from the Danish people. They like it. <laughs> and there are lots of plans. And if you're interested in this, uh, you can talk to Rona McLaughlin, who is here somewhere. You can mail her, or you can look at the GLAD Canada website. So research during the last 20 years has taken a giant, giant leap. And I think that it is time that we put exercise and physiotherapists into action to improve lives and save costs. Thank you. Dr. Roos does have time available now for questions, and I'm certain there will be many of you who would like to have the opportunity to ask her a few questions in follow-up to her presentation this afternoon. We have toss mics, and Tim from CPA is apparently better at AIM than I am, and so he's prepared to uh, toss a mic at you and uh, bring your questions forward for Dr. Roos. <laughs> Put your hand up so he knows where to throw. Oh dear. <laughs> you don't only need to throw, you need to catch them as yeah. well. That might be why I'm definitely not doing it. Um, I now, have a question. Excuse me, what you need to do is hold the microphone up to you with the black dot towards your mouth. Okay, thank you. Uh, I have a question about the, the program was excellent. Um, what's the home program for them? 
or is it like, you know, these programs, what happens after the fact? The first thing is that there is no home pro program while they are in this six, eight week program because um, patients are not very good at doing home exercises. <laughs> I would say it's a waste of time. And they only get bad conscience. We don't do it. We have skipped doing it. So what we spend time on during the education and when we meet the patients is to talk about how they're going to continue afterwards. And there are basically three groups of patients. One third of them uh, still feel that it's very good to have supervision. And in Denmark, uh, a lot of physiotherapists own their own clinic and they have the option that they have little clip cards, you know, so you can buy like 10 times and just go into the gym. But they, they will be able to meet uh, the physio. So many choose that option. And they pay for it themselves, by the way. So Danish patients pay to take this program, but surgery is free. Yeah. yeah. So um, the other option is that people continue to do some kind of physical activity that is available in the community. There are lots of programs avail available in the community. And, and their experience if I talk to individual patients, is that they feel more confident in participating in these programs now. And one third does not continue with anything at all. The rule of thirds. Okay, another question? Button. Hi, um, I enjoyed the presentation. I have one question. Um, you talked about um, patients that have come in and they have the list of things coming from the newspaper, from their friends, which is not evidence-based, of they need MRI or they need x-ray. How do you change the mindset of those individuals from wanting to wait for surgery because- Thank you for that question. <laughs> do you know what? I'm so old now that I've decided not to do things by the book anymore. <laughs> so what we did when we decided to embark upon this endeavor, that was that we made a little strategic plan. And the, the strategic plan was very simple, but it kept us very busy. We said, we would like to contact every journalist that could write something about this in the newspapers or on TV. So we made sure that as soon as we had research data that we could get out there, it, we were really harassing these journalists. And we, did, uh, we wrote our pilot studies from this project and we, we did all our best to talk to journalists. I, it was a very, very busy time. So we actually did just that. And GLAD has now been on TV, in the major newspapers, it's been everywhere. So it has become publicly, there's, there is a public awareness about this. And it's very interesting because we get the feedback, you know, we have a chat room for all these uh, physios that are um, members of the program. And, and uh, not long ago, one of them said, you know, I don't have to spend time anymore in, in talking to my patients about it because they know it works, because they've seen that on TV. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. So I think you're right. Can I throw the mic? Sure, throw it. Thank you so much. That was a wonderful presentation. Oh. Sorry, Dan, and there's someone at the top. Oh, I'm sorry. Thank you, Ewa, for that presentation. I just have a concern. I want to find out, did you give consideration to the levels of severity at the time of this um, research in terms of mild, moderate, and severe severity? No. So the inclusion criteria is really that you have pain and functional limitations that can be attributed to the knee or to the hip. Um, we don't require radiographs. Radiographs are not required by the health authorities in our countries anymore to diagnose osteoarthritis because there is a very poor relation between pain and radiographs. Um, 75% of them have had radiographs. And um, 
usually that would be the way we would uh, stage the disease with radiographs. So in this program, I, don't, I can't do it. I, I can't tell you what severity they have according to radiographs. We do have their pain, so we can see that. They have all levels from 0 to 100. And um, in all the research studies we've done, and in the meta-analysis that we've done of all the 48 studies that were available, we can see that the radiographic level of osteoarthritis does not matter. You have the same uh, improvement regardless of your radiographic severity. That was really uh, mind-boggling to me uh, as well. Um, but that's what the data shows. Um, I, I wasn't talking about the radiographic um, evidence. I was talking about maybe the use of like... Can, using... you, can you please hold the mic? Okay, up? I wasn't referring to radiographic um, evidence. I was, I was just thinking about using um, maybe scale like the locaine, knee severity scale that question and just to assess and be sure that, you know, the level of severity not in relation to radiographs. No. No, you didn't do that. This okay. is real life in the clinic. We don't do anything sophisticated like that. <laughs> Thank you, Diana. Do you want to go ahead then, please? Yeah, just a quickie question. Thank you so much. That was a wonderful presentation, really interesting data. I'm just curious, you mentioned that you did not include a just knee surgery group. And I was wondering why you did not include that. <laughs> you don't well, have to provided what that, we know <laughs> now, one, one could argue that it would be unethical. Um, well, when you run RCTs, there are a lot of concerns and a lot of choices that you have to make. And we have had the experience over the years that I've been working with orthopedic patients that it is easier, because it's not easy to recruit to these studies, but it's, it's, it's somewhat easier to tell a story where you give the same treatment to two groups and then you have an add-on treatment instead of having treatment A and treatment B, because surgery and not surgery is very, very different. So um, I think that is for that reason. But we, we've had that um, question many times. And uh, I think it's really up to someone else to do that study. But I'm really looking forward to the results because when we, I did not show you, but we've done more studies uh, in parallel. So we actually did another study where we took 100 patients who were deemed not eligible for total joint replacement. And then we gave them either a home program <laughs> or the same kind of comprehensive non-surgical treatment. So we had the same 30% improvement in that group. And the group who got the home program, there was no clinically relevant effect. That's why we don't do that. Uh, but but what, is, what is very interesting that when you look at all these studies together, it looks very consistent that you get a 30% pain relief from this non-surgical treatment. And since there was a 60% improvement in the non-surgical treatment group plus surgery, that only leaves 30% improvement to surgery alone. So in theory, 30 plus 30 is 60. But we don't know. Looking at the time, I do think we have to wrap this up at this point in time and uh, express our appreciation to Dr. Roos. I, I wish to thank her so very much for being involved in our second year symposium here at Congress. We truly appreciate you coming to Victoria uh, and hope you enjoy and have some time to enjoy Victoria and for sharing your experiences and your insights. I think we can say that you have inspired us and you have enlightened us to think about our role in promoting healthy aging and to think about the toolbox that is used. But I also think you have challenged us to uh, think about our role from a policy and from a promotion point of view as to who and what we should be doing uh, to change minds and change practices and perhaps change our brand as well. So our sincere appreciation. And on behalf of CPA, I have a small token of our appreciation. Oh.